Good morning. Welcome to the Fowler Avenue Baptist Church, our morning service. And it's good to see everybody here this morning. Amen. And uh, we're excited today. We're going to continue our Faith Promise Missions Conference. We got it started last week. And we were able to hear from uh, two of our missionaries Sunday and two more on Wednesday. And if you weren't able to be here at those services, go on our, our website or on YouTube and you'll be able to catch those messages. They both brought some good testimony, some good messages, and they're at other churches right now. And today we have a special guest with us is Pastor Glenn Mormon, and he's a retired pastor, uh, in, church, pastor of church for 40 years in Maryland. And he now works with Health Ministry as a representative. He, he drives them around to the different churches. He speaks in the churches as a representative. He also mentors the missionaries. He does Bible classes and some teaching with them. So we're welcome uh, Brother Glenn with us this morning. He's been here before. It's been a while, but he's been here before. And he'll be sharing with us today. So we're good to have him in our service. So um, this time I'm going to ask Brother Gerald to come up. Uh, share a song and lead us in an opening prayer. Brother Gerald. Please to Matthew 18. My family moved from Indiana back in 1958, came to Brandon when I was 14. I graduated from Brandon High School in 1962. I got saved in 1966 at Providence Baptist Church under Brother Raymond Hancock. He's my pastor. And um, a couple years after being saved, God began to stir my heart. I was working at the Tampa Post Office, and I loved that job. And uh, God began to pry my hands off of that, and I began to dislike the job I had, because God had another job for me, and that was to be a preacher. And uh, so at that time, Providence had an evening Bible institute, and I met Theron Tuning in 1968. And he taught me evening classes in the Bible. 
and uh, came to love the man. And uh, I'm just so thankful that uh, God gave me the opportunity to use most of my life, 42 years of pastoring, and now six years with help ministry. I am a blessed man. Um, Brother Steve and I were talking earlier this week about me coming and um, wanted me to, if I could, stir your hearts toward missions. And I thought, good night, what a task. Uh, I was uh, back in one of the offices looking at my notes and I, I came across your missionary list and I thought, man, their hearts have already been stirred toward missions. Look at all the missionaries they are supporting. And what you do for help ministry, God bless you so much for housing them and feeding them and loving them. I'm telling you, don't quit because if you ever quit, help ministry is going to be uh, in a wor world of trouble without the Fowler Avenue Baptist Church, I'll tell you. I appreciate uh, the influence the tunings have had on you for missions. God bless you all. My first church in Ohio, I uh, got there and there was a 65 year old guy there and every time we wanted to do something and needed help, I'm too old, I'm 65, let somebody younger do it. And that was his song the two years I was there. I'm too old, I'm too old, I'm too old. Well, on August the 30th, I turned 77, and I, I don't get on Facebook much. When I do, it's normally to put something there about Jesus Christ. Um, in fact, uh, there was a thing on there just recently. Who, who's the most famous person you've spoken to? And somebody put Ronald Reagan. I put Jesus Christ. He's the most famous person you can speak to. Well, I wrote this on my 77th birthday. What are you supposed to do when you turn 77? If we haven't already figured that out, could I offer you a few thoughts on what it means to me? First, I need to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. After all, I will be seeing God pretty soon. Jesus is coming soon and I um, need to be looking for his return more earnestly and excitedly. And I don't expect to live very many more years anyhow. Secondly, I need to love my family more and not less. My Bible tells me to love my wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Tall order. I need to love my faithful wife who has given her own life for me and her children, her grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren. The only thing a man can take to heaven with him is his safe family members. Thirdly, I need to love lost people more. People all around me are going to hell. I need to open my eyes and see their terrible plight if they die lost in their sins. I don't want more blood on my hands for not telling them the gospel. I need to get, give out more tracts. I need to open my mouth and talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Let others talk about the weather, the COVID, the economy, and the price of gas. I need to stop letting the devil silence me when my silence may help send a sinner to his doom. At age 77, I'm choosing to step up my game for my great Savior. Could I interest you fellow senior Christians in trying to do more and not less in the days you have left? Let's get more, let's give more of our hard-earned money to help missionaries in some distant land. Take the good news of our Lord to folks who have never heard of Jesus, never heard of heaven or of hell. So let's get up and use the energy and time we have left in really getting serious about serving God. We will be glad we did. Well, my message this morning is called K-I-S-S. Uh, my wife uh, asked me the other day, I was working on a new sermon. She says, what's the title of your new sermon? I, I said, K-I-S-S. She walked over and gave me a big kiss. So uh, I had a lady in my church in Maryland. She would watch the clock when I preached. And if I preached too long, she, when she left, she'd say, K-I-S-S. Keep it short, stupid. But my kiss is, keep it simple, saint. Amen. Keep it simple. You're, you have your Bible open there to Matthew 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and sat him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is great 
greatest in the kingdom of heaven. To me, as an older person, I read this and I say, whatever Jesus wants us to do, let's keep it simple. Let's be like a little child in their faith and keep it simple. We have become in our churches too sophisticated, too slick, too com complicated. The churches today, we, we know more about packaging and selling our churches than we know about the power that the church needs. Ministers have the best vocabularies, I guess, of any time in history. But we have less of the moving of the Holy Spirit on our midst than we've ever had it, also in the history of the church. Too many preachers know more about counseling than they do about witnessing in the power of God. There are marketing firms that churches now can hire to help them to show how they can grow their churches. They put smoke up on the altar and they have lights everywhere and the guys are preaching in their blue jeans now. The church desperately needs a revival of simplicity and purpose and function. A careful study of our spiritual roots would dictate a reevaluation of both our message and our methods. Let's make the gospel simple like it is. God loves the world. Jesus died for the world. You must be saved. Our Lord was in the redemption business, period. That's why Christ came. And the good news, you have it before you every Sunday, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's simple, isn't it? It's a task. How in the world are we going to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Missionaries. God had a plan for the world. Go to Acts and you'll find out that Barnabas and Saul were the first missionaries that were called. They were prayed for. They were sent by the church. They were supported by the churches. That's what God still wants us to do today. What are we trying to do? What are we going to do and what are we going to give to win the world to Jesus Christ? Seven years ago, my mother and one of my four sisters died within a month of each other. And being from Indiana, we went back and had a memorial service together for my mom and my sister. Our next door neighbors in Indiana where I grew up was a set of twin boys. They were my age, Ronnie and Donnie Hauser. Ronnie died at age 50 with cancer. I never saw him after I got saved. I never had the privilege to tell him about Jesus Christ. Donnie read in the paper about the memorial service and came to the memorial service to pay his respects to our family. I had not seen him for over 50 years. When he got ready to leave, my brother and I walked him out to his truck and spent the next 15 minutes preaching to him the gospel. We begged him to get saved. He says, oh, I still like my beer, still like my beer. Well, that was good because my brother was an alcoholic when he got saved and he began to tell him how Christ could help him with that. He said, well, the lady I live with, she's not my wife, not married. So we, we kept it simple. Donnie, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for your sins. You must be saved. Don't go on living thinking that you're going to just die and it's all over if you don't receive Christ as your Savior. He got in his truck and drove off seven years ago. Five years passed by. My Aunt Linda that lives there in Indiana called to let me know that Dottie had come by her home to get my phone number and my brother's phone number because he had gotten saved and wanted to let us know it was because we had made the gospel understandable and simple and he believed in and got saved. And I've talked to him several times on the phone. He's excited about the Lord. Now some very creative person imagined that Jesus said to Peter, Peter, whom do others say that I am? And Peter said, 
You are the crystallized conception of the deification of God's incarnate and supernal altruism revealed in myriad manner through manifest coalitions of soteriological portrayal. And Jesus said, what? He simply is the son of God who came to seek and to save those who were lost. As a communicator of the gospel, you and I ought to ask ourselves, do people understand what it is we're trying to tell them? Jesus knew how to communicate. Remember the two fellows on the road to Emmaus that Jesus spoke to after his resurrection? Here's what they said. And their eyes were opened and they said to one to another, did not our heart burn within us? While we talked, while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, I just wonder, does anybody speak to us and we tell them about Jesus? Does their heart burn within them and they go away wondering if this is not something they need? Every follower of football remembers the name Vince Lombardi, Green Bay Packers and then Washington Redskins. They say he never let the team forget why they were wearing helmets. As a player left the Packer dressing room, he had a large sign over the door, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. He said, you're not out there to model new uniforms, new helmets. He had a very narrow concept of what football was all about. Score more points than the other team. In life, we want to win more souls than what Satan is getting. Our task as Christians is to win the lost, train them in their faith, and send them out to win the lost. Anything else is window dressing. Our Lord's instruction is so clear. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you. Keep it simple, saint. So my first question is, what are we trying to do? Would you turn, you're in Matthew 18, turn to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4, and look at verse 19. What is it that we're trying to do? Matthew 4, 19. And he saith unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I love their response. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Jesus also said, if you love me, do whatsoever I command you. Christ said, my purpose, my reason." For coming, my responsibility is to do the will of him that sent me to finish his work. And later he said, now as my father has sent me, so send I you. In his best-selling book, Megatrends, John Nesbitt, the author, comments that the railroads were the most prestigious corporations at one time in America. The Pennsylvania Railroad, they said, was chosen as the best-run corporation in America. This is not so today. Railroads, many places, are in disrepair. They lose money like crazy. Nesbitt said, what happened? He said they misunderstood the law of the situation. Every business has a situation something they're trying to fill. And he said it requires that we ask ourselves, what business are we really in? The railroad magnets thought they were in the business of running railroads. He says, wrong. They were in the business of transportation. He said if they'd have realized that they were in the transportation business, they would have eventually got trucks Airplanes, ships, and everything else that moves people and produce. But they got left behind by others that understood better the transportation business. 
Many people in church believe their business is to go to church. No, my friend, your business is not to go to church. Your business and my business is to win the world to Jesus Christ. But we love going to church. That's part of that's part of worship. We need to we need to be in the house of God. We need going to church. But that's not why we got saved. Our job is to take the gospel to the whole world. The whole world. How do we do it? Worldwide missionaries. That's how it's done. We need to pray <clears throat> that the young people in churches in America would catch a vision of going to a destitute, lost part of the world and giving their entire life to winning those people to Jesus Christ. And this older people like me and some of you need to give our hard-earned money to put them there and to keep them there. So what are we trying to do? Our job is to fulfill the biblical assignment that God gave to the church. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to win converts wherever we are planted. You know, God puts people in front of us every day that need to hear our witness. Secondly, how are we going to do this enormous task? How? Would you turn with me to Matthew 16, 24? Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. With the power of God on a Christian's life, giving us the ability to say no, yes, no to a job we like or no to a pleasure that we like so that we can do God's business that is the most important business in all the world. We need to deny ourselves for that. I had just gotten to Maryland in 1974 and a man had just gotten saved before I arrived, maybe just a couple weeks before. Um, nobody had told him that he needed to give up his cigarettes yet. He told me that he got a burden for a co-worker and he took his Bible to church and on break, he sat in the break room and was witnessing to this co-worker that he had a burden for. And he said while he was smoking his cigarette and reading the Bible, he looked at both those, he said, man, this doesn't go together. And so he realized, God, you're gonna have to help me with this and take these things away. And he said, God took them away. He was the manager of a 7-Eleven. He said he began to look at all the alcohol that he handled. All the truckloads of alcohol that came into his store and all that he had to sell. And he said, man, this, I'm not sure this is the life I want to live any longer. And he gave up his job and God gave him a better job. That's what God means, or I think Jesus means, hey, you want to be my disciple? There's some things that need to be changed maybe in our life. But if we trust God and let him change us, he gives us a better deal than what we have. Have you learned that living for God isn't easy? It's not always easy. Is it always convenient? I found that it can be a little inconvenient at times. Hey, is it expensive? It can be. 
I have found there are missionaries everywhere that need support. My heart goes out to them and sometimes my checkbook goes with it. Our pattern is Jesus. He came here to help everybody that he could. We're not in the country club business. We're in the redemption business. It is not always easy. It's not always convenient. It's not always cheap. But it's God's plan. And it's a great plan. It means going on visitation. It means giving out tracts. It means giving some of your hard-earned money to a missionary who will do a much better job if we help him just a little bit in a part of the world we'll never get to go to. It's more than saying I'm saved. It's living saved. It's dying saved. My wife and I were spending a few days with some friends in Fort Myers. They'd been in our church in Maryland several years and we had become good friends. We were down spending a couple days with them. Over coffee one morning, they said, uh, Pastor, we're in the midst of trying to figure out our estate, how we're gonna handle it when we go to heaven. We love children. She had worked many years in the Awana program at our church. We love children, and we want to leave some of what God has blessed us with to an orphanage, a Christian orphanage. She said, do you have any idea of a Christian orphanage that we could leave in our will? I had just gotten involved with health ministry. I had just learned that they support 14 foreign Christian orphanages and so I told Jim and Barbara, those are the only ones I know. That was the only conversation I had with Jim and Barbara about their estate. Some months ago, I got a call from Ron Cole. Do, do they know who Ron Cole is? Director of Health Ministry of North Carolina office. <laughs> Brother Mormon, you know a Jim and Barbara Bryant? I said, well, of course I know Jim and Barbara Bryan, good friends of ours. He said, well, I want to tell you the good news. He said, uh, we came into the office and a lady by the name of Barbara had left a message on our phone from a Maryland phone number saying they needed certain information uh, about health ministry so that they could put the ministry for orphans into their will. Uh, Ron said, man, I didn't know anybody would know about help ministry from Maryland. I didn't know how she would have found out about it, but she, he said, when I finally got a hold of her and uh, she told me that she had been in your church several years, um, I just wanted you to know that they told us they believed God wanted them to lay up some treasure in heaven by helping a Christian orphanage. Imagine what it will be like one day if we're as smart as they are and we leave in our will not all of our money for our kids to fight over, no. We leave in our will our local church, missionaries, orphans, whatever you believe God wants you to do. Can you imagine that one day, going into heaven and finding out that some little orphan was supported by your will and got saved and is going to spend eternity with you. I'm telling you what, folks. Um, you and I have an opportunity in this brief life to do something with eternal dividend. I know you're already doing it. I, I, I see this list, list, long list of missionaries. But I believe we can do more. 
I believe we can give a little more. I believe we can help another missionary that comes that needs some help and some prayer. So what are we doing? We're in the redemption business. How do we do it? First of all, we need the power of God. It's, it's an insurmountable task to win the world, to preach the gospel to every creature without the power of God Almighty. You and I need the power of the Holy Spirit actively enduing us with power from on high to do this enormous task. <clears throat> you remember the good Samaritan? He found this man that had been beaten up and robbed. What did he do with him? He bound up his wounds, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn, and he said to the innkeeper, Hey, I brought you this man. I have to leave. I want you to take care of him. Spend whatever you have to to get him well. And when I come back, what? I'll pay you for it. Now, isn't that a great illustration of, of Jesus? He, he says, look, the world is full of beaten, bruised, bleeding, lost, sick people. Go find them. Bring them to me. Bring them to heaven. Get them saved. Whatever you spend, when I come back, I'll bring my reward with me. You say, you make it too simple. No, you can't make it too simple. Jesus said, you become like children, you get the job done. On Friday, my eldest son, Doug, that took over my church in Maryland, texted me to let me know that Pete Raymond, a missionary that our church there in Maryland had supported for many years, he had been notified that Pete had died in El Paso, Texas, on the mission field. Pete and Joy were in Tennessee Temple while I was there, and we became good friends. He was called to be a missionary to the Spanish-speaking people, so he and Joy went to the Spanish people in 1973. Five years ago, Joy died in El Paso, Texas. Peter died, or um, <clears throat> Pete died uh, just a couple months ago, after 48 years of winning Spanish people to Christ. And I tell us this to remind us that, folks, we're all going to die one day. I don't know, you may have other plans, but I hate to interrupt your, your party, but you're going to die. And you and I are going to go out and meet God. And what comes next? judgment our judgment some say it doesn't matter how I live well we'll find that out at the judgment won't we some say hey doesn't matter if I don't tell anybody about Jesus that's what the preacher's supposed to do I will find out about that at judgment some say I don't want to do the will of God. I, I don't want to be a missionary. Well, we'll find out how you fare at judgment. I was visiting one of my members at the Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring, Maryland. and There was another man in the hospital room with him, so I wanted to say a word to him about Christ. So I stepped over to his bed and introduced myself and asked him if he knew the Lord as his Savior. Turns out he was a Methodist man, gave a good testimony that he knew the Lord. And here's what he said to me before I left. I'll read it to you, quote, almost word for word. He said, the conditions in our world are so bad, there's trouble everywhere. I was just wondering if the end of the world was coming soon. I left the hospital and I wondered to myself, wow, if the Methodists are worried, shouldn't the Baptists be worried? <laughs> Christian friends, I've been saved for over 50 years and I miss, I miss so much the urgency of the church 
when I got saved. Go now and tell your relatives. Go now and preach the gospel. Go now. Go now. I miss that urgency. I do. I miss the day when young people were flocking to the mission field. I miss the day when older people sacrificed. I remember at Providence, Brother Hancock would, there'd be a need, somebody needed something. People would bring jewelry. I, I mean, people gave stuff. They didn't have the money, they sacrificed what they had. I miss those days. I miss seeing people weep over their lost loved ones. I hear people today talk, well, my children aren't saved, my husband not saved, and it's like, what? I miss the day when people wept for their parents to get saved. I miss the day when people wept over their children without Christ. And I miss the days When there was an urgency, we gotta get it done. God's counting on us. What are we going to do to help win the lost? What are we willing to give to help win the lost? I think you'll be glad for everything you do and everything you give when you meet the Lord. Because he